And then Korean okay. casting, like in team fights, <laughs> actually the roles are really funny where um, Caster Jun, who just is the play by play caster, and Dongjin and Cloud Templar, they're yelling and screaming. They just react, right? <laughs> they're just screaming in the background. Like in the team fight, they're going like, ah, ah! Like they're literally making like chicken noises and they're yelling okay. in the background. And that's like, yeah. that's like Korean casting, I guess. Okay, this is going to be episode 23 of Listen Loco. 23 actually is a number that famously has been associated with people who are really into synchronicity. Like it's a famous number that they made that movie about, if you remember with Jim Carrey, where the concept is when you start looking into it, like everywhere there's 23s. So you're ready mm -hmm. local. It's how you do a segue, son. So obviously we've picked someone who also is ubiquitous within the league scene, which would be Dash here, yeah. who you've seen every time you watch the what was the NALCS, but has now rebranded, they say rebranded, rebranded to Czech Snorts, the LCS, right? So not that different, but yeah, it's the LCS now, right? All right, who would have thought? Who would have thought? Um, yeah, lucky for us, EU decided to go a completely different direction so we could just drop the NA and, and hold yes, on lucky to the, for you. the LCS brand. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start with lowbrow humor. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's my main question to start with. All right. right. Obviously, people know we're going to talk about the upcoming LCS season. And we're going to get into more broad topics, but I actually want to start with like being a desk host, etc. Because actually, in the Riot world, beyond over in EU, where obviously we've had shocks and at times quick shots played that role. In NA, I notice that was actually a role that just seemed to be like swapped around, and they never really had like a set person to do that. It feels like so. Right. Was this actually something that when you came into Riot and you got this job, like? That was like it had already been carved out like this is what you'll do did you have to kind of like win them over what was it like um well so my my whole story of getting into uh riot is pretty long-winded but by the time by the time i eventually made it in for interviews um with the esports team waylon uh very plainly said to me as i had told him i was interested in becoming a caster and at the time i uh wanted to be a color caster uh, he said, well, I got to be honest with you. We don't really need more casters. Sure. Yeah. But he goes, but there is a role that we, that has never existed in North America that we do feel needs to be filled, and that is of a desk host. So he pitched it to me, actually, in my initial interview with the eSports team, and I said, well, heck, yeah, that's definitely something I think I could do. Um, so we just kind of developed a, a plan for you know how to – I, what's the word kind of um shift me into that position so i actually got hired i got hired i was working for six months as a contractor in the esports department uh just doing various odd jobs and getting to know the team uh practicing a bit behind the scenes doing rehearsals and whatnot and then it wasn't until that summer of 2014 that i actually went on air for the first time so they did a little bit of work to make sure that i was coached up uh vetted my knowledge around the game at least to the degree that i could you know conduct a thorough conversation post game you know conversation um and at that point when they when they felt felt comfortable they they put me up there so i didn't necessarily have to it was not my idea to begin with i wanted to be a color caster it was pitched okay. to me but i figured hey that sounds like a great role um and i fell in love with it so that's kind of that's how it was born because the thing that's actually unusual for people who don't know the industry is typically that sort of a role of a host is would normally, if it was going to be a commentator, it would be the play-by-play -play commentator. Because usually that's the person who asks the question rather than answers the question. But I have to right. say, when in CSGO I do the analysis role, the few times where I've had to like host a desk, or I actually once did a whole event where like they sort of let me be an analyst and a host, it was just smaller desk. I have to say, as much as obviously it's its own skill set, and I didn't have time to learn like the polish and stuff, it actually can be more fun if you can do that role as someone coming in with game knowledge because then you know yes. where you want the conversation to go and you know how to keep it going, etc. Whereas you see the people whose main skill set is like just looking very professional and looking and maybe they have their questions. It's going to be harder for them to sort of like know what to draw out of people is my theory at least. Anyway, so I'm interested mm -hmm. to see that that's your role. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think the most exciting thing about the hosting role is... Um the mus the muscle that it causes you to work or flex is is your people skills um yes again it requires some level of game knowledge but i don't have to be the expert i have somebody like you on the desk or jet or monty or any of these number of analysts across the world who hold all the knowledge mm -hmm. but it's up to me to craft an entire segment from start to finish know the journey that i want to take the viewer on and also know 
the three analysts on my desk, what makes them tick? What's going to get this guy excited? What can I say to piss this guy off, right? So of that course, it creates yeah. an excitement. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I, I get to, like, you know, watch people during the day and be like, ooh, okay, he's yes. he really hates that champion. So when that champion gets played this week in the LCS, I'm going straight to him about it. So it's a yeah. lot about how you understand people and their behaviors and how to how to get those little bits out of people to, to create the best possible segment. That makes a lot of sense, though, because actually I have noticed this. I didn't notice when I first started doing analysis in CSGO, but I actually noticed over time that the people who were the best hosts, right, when you're in the green room watching the game, as an analyst, you're just watching the game, usually just talking to people, watching it. And I noticed actually the host is usually watching what you're watching and asking you questions about like, oh, what did you think of that? Was that the wrong movement? And at first, right, you just think... This guy's a noob, right? He's, you know, right. I just need to give him up to speed. But what you later on realize is exactly what you're saying. Like, for example, if they know you like low key hit one team and you think that they're really overrated, he's going to find a way to make his question, which to the audience just seems like a normal question about that team. He's going to find a way to make sure he asks you that. So, so the way they played in that game, they are the best team in League of Legends, right? Just knowing that you want to, you, you, you're just dying to go, no, they're not, that's over it. Right. He's got to know the setup in a way, right? Exactly. And and it is. It's all about creating those relationships. And so the one thing I really enjoyed about last year was finally having some consistency um, with working with Mark and Jat. Because mm. prior to last year, I also had a rotating yes. guest of analysts. And, and that makes the host job more difficult because every day you're working with a new set of variables that you have to, you know, finagle, maneuver and figure out how to fit together. And so... Uh, being afforded the opportunity to work with the same people for a length of time, which I know you've done on desks, uh, I feel really allowed for a, a fair amount of growth last year, uh, particularly in the analyst space in North America, for us to understand, okay, these are the things Mark's passionate about. These are the things Jat's passionate about. These are the things that uh, you know, make Mark tick, make Jat tick, and here's how I can pit them against each other. Here's how I can put them on the same side across from me any number of, of things and produce the, the best quality um, analyst uh, segment that we can. Um, so yeah, it's been a wild uh, ride for me these last five years. Again, I never expected to be here. I never even expected to be at Riot. Uh, somebody sure. offered me the job, the opportunity, um, just kind of out of the blue. And I said I'd be an idiot not to, you know, at least pursue it to some degree. And then here I am five years later, more invested and more ingrained in this community and this product than I ever have been. Um, but yeah, ultimately grateful for the opportunity and, and really excited for, you know, uh, continued growth. I do think that my acting training helped me with that bit that I talked about in terms of understanding ticks, right. understanding the psychology of humans and like how to, how to phrase or ask something or play an action, you know, in, in the, technique that I was trained in the Stella Adler technique. It's all about psychological actions. So everything that you do is phrased in a verb form. So to intimidate, to seduce, to um, badger, to command, right? And so whatever, whatever text you're saying, you, you put in that psychological, you know, subtext behind it. And you could say any phrase a million different ways. Right. Right. And that phrase, the phrase, the words are typically less relevant than the You're tonality. Trying to emotion or something, right? I'll exactly. So I, I could say, screw you, but I could say it in a seducing way and I could sure. say it in a, in a commanding way and I could say yes. it in this other way. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's going to elicit a different response from you. So understanding kind of like how to, uh, you know, to, to reframe my own verbiage uh, has been very useful to me. Okay. Right. Look, I actually had a question on this that I wanted to get your take on, which is, what up? right. So people who've ever seen, like when they used to have obviously LCK now, when it used to be OG and champions was mm -hmm. when the, the tradition started with that guy who comes out, cast a and mm -hmm. he does that whole great intro, you know, yeah. the problem obviously is all the Westerners just hear that. And we, we can get that he's you know, hyped and he's going mm -hmm. on his side, but no one, they almost never translated what he said. And mm -hmm. obviously we had an English language stream. So no one knows what the analysis desk is like mm -hmm. in Korea. Like when the casters speak between the games, like what is it actually? like what is the contrast like so one of the few people who could actually give us some insight on that so uh, i actually really like what dash said regarding um synergy between casters or people on the desk and actually really getting to know them like the combination matters so much so um in original og and the person you have in the middle oh my god his name's escaping me the who's the really hype shout caster the one that you worked with dash um caster uh, june yeah caster june so yeah. there's <laughs> 
I just said that a minute ago, but yeah. keep going. Okay. Okay. It flipped my mind. So. I know. He just waits until my mouth stops moving, doesn't yeah. he? That's, <laughs> that's why I was confused. I was like, okay, so it's Caster yeah. June. Okay. Uh, so, sorry. Yeah, Caster June. So there's Caster June, and then there used to be this um, person named Carrie. Um, he was he like in StarCraft days, so it was oh, Caster Carrie June. Kim. Yeah, yeah. Um, Caster June, Carrie, and then there's um, this fat guy that was a comic book artist. Oh my, I can't. All these names are escaping me, but there's this fat guy that was a comic book artist, and they worked really well together. Where Carrie would be like really hyphy and talk about certain um, moments in the game really well, and then the fat guy, the comic guy, was so good. You're at... so Korean, you know, dude. Like, I yeah. get, I'm, you're not offending me by saying yeah. fat, but like, it's only Koreans would be like, yeah. oh, you know, my uh, fat friend, uh, Bill. It's like, why don't you just call him fucking Bill? Like, why does he have to be fat? Like, yeah. I, don't, I understand local, but it's such a Korean thing to just be so blunt like that. Okay, so the dick. I hope none of, the, I hope none of these people in this story are going to be ugly there. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Like... So the dick <laughs> comic book artist guy yes. was okay. so good about ter- telling storylines because, I mean, he came from a comic book world, so that was his role. And then, obviously, Caster June brought it all together and he let it flow and then he would be like talking about like he would be casting and then Jim Carrey would be like yelling over him and then afterwards the dick comic book guy would like bring it all together in the story so they developed like a synergy really well and then moving on to League of Legends Caster June still stayed and he kept this role about like being like the backbone and also asking questions he was like the everyday man like he would ask questions and then kim dong jun would be very very technical and he would talk about a lot of aspects one thing about dong jun that i respect so much dong jun i think watches more league of legends than anyone in the world he he when he was casting like he would know random stuff from like turkish league oh in turkish league they play this champion first in lpl they do this in europe they do this in lck they do this and it was crazy like how many little things he knew i think he watches more than any analyst on the team like he's just obsessed about league of legends he always brings in some small obscure detail that you can only get from watching all the leagues and also in korea the casters and the teams are much closer due to the relationship between um kespa and ogn and also casting continuing over so it's very common for casters to come over and watch scrims i know in nalcs casters sometimes do that but there's nothing um NA casters are not trustworthy, but there is sure. less trust between the teams and the casters in NA compared to Korea, where they're like, ah, right. they would we, never... We only started building that relationship just about a year or two ago. Mm-hmm. Did NA casters start uh, viewing scrims? So mm-hmm. just to support Loco's point, it definitely has been shorter lived here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I remember like back when I was pro, that's like four or five years ago, like Kim Dong Jun would come over and like watch and that's how I got introduced to Dong Jun. And I like adored Dong Jun because I was a StarCraft fan. I was like, holy fuck, like he's coming in watching watching us practice and stuff. But yeah, it's very, very common in Korea for um, casters to watch and going back to what you're saying. The... To be fair, some mm-hmm. of the LEC casters even watch wildcard regions like NA, so... <laughs> Whatever. It was low hanging fruit and it keep going anyway. Don't let me <laughs> derail you too much on that one. Yeah, so, there we go. Um Dong Jin is like the really specialized analyst bringing all the facts and Cloud Templar is actually kind of like the funny one. So he'll make okay. a lot of jokes around like the players, like he'll talk about like he'll make a lot of analogies. Like he's like he's definitely like the fun one of the group. And then Korean okay. casting, like in Team Fights, <laughs> actually the roles are really funny where um Caster Jun who just is the play by play caster and Dong Jin and Cloud Templar, they're yelling and screaming. They just react, right? <laughs> they're just screaming in the background. Like in the team fight, they're going like, ah, ah! Like they're literally making like chicken noises and they're yelling in the okay. background. And that's like, yeah. that's like Korean casting, I guess. For, any, for anyone who wants to talk shit on Freak when he casts, he doesn't do that. Like, give him credit. He at least says words and things. Right. He doesn't just go, oh my God. Oh. Like, I can't lie, by the way. When you don't understand Korean, it does sound amazing. But I imagine it it probably it's not, not as no. sick when you actually know what they're saying. But their synergy is built up like really well. And it's done over years and years. Right. And like, um, I know Cloud Templar and Dong Jin like ask Caster June a lot about like, hey, what kind of role should we have? And like, it's something like okay. they master like together. And now the ro- there's some like rotations every now and then. But the trio I mentioned in StarCraft is the golden trio for StarCraft. And then the trio of Caster um, Dong Jin, Caster Jun, and Cloud Templar it got named the new golden yes. trio for League of Legends. Do they ever have in uh, Korea though? Do they actually ever have banter? Is that ever a part of like a commentary or analysis or anything? Is that even a concept? Um, they'll make like jokes like whenever Tarek is played, it's like, oh, um, Dong Jun, what are you doing in the game? Like, because Dong Jun looks like Tarek, and then he also did a Riot promotional <laughs> video 
where he had like the yeah. long hair. So like oh, right. they'll yeah. do stuff like that. That guy like, is pretty good looking. I have to say the dog. He's good looking guy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. He's got a hell of a jawline. Probably. Yeah. And then what if it, whenever a moon was played or like when Cloud Templar recently left Fize, like within the year or two, whenever oh, Fize is yes. losing, like they'll be like, Cloud, if you were there, how would have you have done? Like would right. you have been able to save okay. Fize? So little like that, but definitely not the banter level of like Fiesco desk or sure. even like NAL CS desk. It's yeah. a, a bit more. Re- I would say respectful um just due to the culture and due to like what korean fans expect out of esports okay that's un- obviously understandable if you consider like politeness in korea i want to ask you about that though dash because obviously one of the things that used to be heavily uh, pointed out about riot productions in the early days of when the lcs began etc was people portrayed them as the caricature of like the too uptight you know like in the quest for professionalism you know you lose a bit of the humanity and it's like it's like trying to be too much like the nfl on sundays always my mm-hmm. analogy because the thing about that is you know it's supposed to be the idea that like oh kids could be watching you know it must be very professional it's like you're not really allowed to do any kind of banter in that setting so I know yeah. over the years, even if people still like stereotype it that way, it's clearly loosened up a lot over the years. So is there a sense in uh, for like what the room is for this aspect of doing the analysis test? Because it's clearly a, a part that enhances the show if you do it right. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I think uh, I don't I can't, I'm trying to pinpoint, you know, at, at what past date did we kind of make that realization that, hey, you know, wow, being professional and being, you know, uh, or striving for top tier production quality is a good thing. It does not have to dominate or be the sole, you know, attribute of our broadcast. And I can't, I guess it was around the time that, um, I guess it was myself, Mark Z and Crumb. So that was like two years, two-ish years ago, spring splits, the 2017 spring split, when we had a, again, this whole idea of a dedicated analyst desk. Yes. And prior to that, because we didn't have an opportunity to to separate ourselves from the casting team and say, hey, what do we want to do this week? What do we as a trio, you know, what storylines do we want to push? What jokes do we want to make? And how do we want to tell these storylines? Once we landed on that kind of uh, uh, desk makeup, we we were afforded the opportunity and the time to, to have those conversations and ultimately decide that, hey, there's a way to celebrate a team without just saying, hey, this team is really good. And here's a whole bunch of statistics and replays to explain why they're good. Yeah, you got to have evidence. Yes, you have to have some analysis. But we did the whole Phoenix, you know, rising yeah. from the ashes thing of, of crumbs. And like that was the beginnings of us understanding that like there are ways to tell or infer storylines and narrative without just reciting words into a camera, right? You can, we could create a skit. So then, you know, fast forward to now it's uh, myself, Mark, and Jat uh, in 2018. We had the whole jat with the board of all the possibilities we're beating the hell out of zoe for the with the nerf bat you know like all that kind of stuff we're like sure. what what we what we first attacked was let's develop an amazing top quality product polished and top quality product then we had we realized we go okay but now it still needs to be appealing and accessible to our audience and and this is where that i think that nfl point is is a great point because our audience is not the NFL audience. Sure, exactly. Right? And so understanding that our audience is different, our community is different, their wants, needs, desires, right? The things they laugh at, the things they want to know, learn, are all different. Once we started to hone in on on those things, we could better craft segments, you know, that our audience would appreciate. And that's where a little bit more of that fun has come. Second to that, it's just comfortability on the desk. Again, this idea that not only have I gotten better as a host, and I truly believe your desk can only be as good as your host is, right? Sure. I mean, or as any member on the desk, but the host is- Sure, but it can be a limiting place. factor, clearly, you know, mm-hmm. if, if they're not very good. Right, so I mean, five years down the line, I'm, you know, incrementally better than I was when I first started. And I think that alone has allowed me to not be so rigid. I was a very rigid host when I first started. I had a plan for every segment and I would not stray from that plan no matter what happened. You know, oh, we're going from this replay to this replay and I'm going to ask Jat this question and then I'm going to ask Freak this question, you know. And now I'm just like, I have a general sense of what we want to talk about in the segment and I know what our elements are, but I'm not like pre-scripting it Hmm. like I used to. And so I'm more open to banter and saying, you know what? 
scrap that point. It's not relevant anymore. I'm really intrigued by what, what you guys are talking about now. Let's go down that rabbit hole. So that's helped. And then again, that whole idea of once you get three people together and you say, this yes. is it for the whole year, you have time to iterate and learn and say, okay, this joke didn't land. Why not? How can we adjust this thing? This segment wasn't good or was great. How do we make it better? And stuff like that. Beyond that, also just having more tools available. We had those that we have the BFTS stations where uh, we can have one of the analysts go and actually show you mechanics in the practice tool and stuff. So that kind of variety, I think, has also helped to make the show more accessible. So not every segment is three dudes sitting behind a desk saying, let's go through a replay and talk about how this team won. Sometimes it's not that interesting. Team hard smashed. Great, but they did it with Heimerdinger. So let's do a Heimerdinger segment and teach people how to play Heimerdinger because that's more relevant than just an 18-minute win by Golden Guardians or whatever. Hmm. The, see, what he's saying there, Lork, actually, about the fact that this was all possible by having, like, dedicated analysts is actually another key area that League of Legends was able to progress because I know the same exact thing happened in CSGO. Like, what people don't know, it's funny because people, when, when they criticize me in CSGO, always point out the most obvious thing, which is that I was never a professional CSGO player. Mm -hmm. but what they don't understand is, yeah, that looks, if you look today, like the difference because every other person who's an analyst used to be a pro, sometimes very recently. Mm -hmm. But what they don't know is that I was originally the only analyst like we used to have me and then sometimes Richard or the odd other person would be there but everyone else was just like in league it was a commentator who wasn't commentating that game mm -hmm. and he would just swap in for this one game he might not have even watched that team play earlier in the day he can only comment probably on what he saw in the game if I don't know the guy super well like I'm probably not going to try and like throw some banter his way or anything I'm going to stick more in my lane you know do mm -hmm. my part let's pass it over to him and I have to say like it, that's what feeds into the comfortability aspect that he was saying there it's like once you know people that's another thing people don't understand it's like the reason why people never come on my shows mm -hmm. and then go away going like oh you know you disrespected me and it was a terrible experience it's because if i know very early on like they're just not the sort of person who's going to be able to vibe if i like make fun of them or that you know there's someone who's not that confident speak i'm not going to attack that person you know i'm going to wait till it's the guy i know can do that now the best ones by the way sometimes are the people that they seem quiet, but privately, you know, they've got a really great sense of humor. So that mm. might seem like you just throwing it out there, but actually knowing how, what the other person is like is essential to making the show good, in my opinion. Mm. Why do you attack me all the time then? I feel like I don't, I get it. Thought it. Local, people <laughs> don't know this, but I actually just explained it. You actually fall into the latter category. Like yeah. people think that you are Look. super sensitive or whatever, but I've even told you this privately. I'm actually impressed that concern how much you get flamed on Reddit. Mm. So it never seems to actually, Rattle yet? It doesn't seem to tilt yet. So Reddit flame is different. Reddit flame, I think Reddit people are idiots. So I'm like, whatever. <laughs> like well, that, that'll definitely stop the flame, but okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But like when you flame me on stuff, sometimes I'm like, fuck you, Thorin, because like I mean I genuinely like know you and like like you as a friend. And then like when a friend says something versus like some random idiot on the street or some random idiot using the keyboard, like it's two different things. So Monty Monty and you call me sensitive a lot, but I actually respect you and Monty's opinion. And when you and Monty flame me, it's very different than some random okay. idiot or even like a player saying it. But I think so. This is funny. This is touching on something I think is integral to any any form of entertainment, which is that conflict is necessary. Right. For something to be entertaining. It is not you don't go watch a movie where the two love interests are happy go lucky for an hour and a half. Nothing changes and they're still happy go lucky at the end. That's not an interesting movie. Mm -hmm. And so conflict is integral to everything. And and part of that conflict when we talk about esports is the literal match at hand, the two teams that are conflicting. But it is is equally important in our analysis and storytelling. It is again not fun when the pregame is this team's amazing and this team is not and everyone on the desk agrees and we all agree that the game will be played this way and we all agree that this is this and then the game plays and then the game ends and we come back and we go yep they won because of this and mark says yep i agree with chat and i say okay sounds good let's go to break <laughs> that was a, that was an hour and a half of boring right mm -hmm. at least you know the we can't control the teams but what we can control is, yes. is how we present that information and so that's why the challenge for both the host and for an you know for an analyst is to figure out how to create conflict around any given match even when there isn't much right and that's why some games are harder to talk about than others when you got the 10th place team against the winless last place team how do you make that interesting right you got you got to find some way 
Uh, otherwise, I would just say don't do the segment, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Come, c- go from commercial straight into the game. It's worse to create bad content than to create no content in the, in the that, scope of a, of a product. That's a also product. basically another thing that very much aligns with my own philosophy from doing the job. I've t- I don't know if I've told this on any of the episodes of this show because it's obviously CSGO related, but whenever I did banter in CSGO in the early days, obviously it was just whenever I thought of a good joke. You know, I didn't like force it or anything, but I learned over the years that, that actually, because it can just be a tool, it's not just a thing you do on the side, because it can be a way to entertain. Like you're saying, I actually learned that the best way to apply the blueprint is the less interesting the game is, both in terms of the context of the teams and the actual match, maybe it's a terrible game, that's when you put in more of your own uh, kind of personality because the idea is, right, the game couldn't actually entertain any of us. So in this particular segment, we're going to entertain them. When the game's amazing, if it's like the final or something, or some epic game, obviously at that time, you just stick to the pure analysis. You know, you're not going to put as much kind of fun on top because the, it's already provided the entertainment. Right, absolutely, 100% agree. Local, mm-hmm. where do you want to start then? If we're going to start talking about I mean, not the NALCS, the LCS, where do yeah, you want to start? Come on. I mean, let's start with TSM, our favorite topic. All right, let's do it. I mean, let's the, make enemies early. <laughs> <laughs> the I mean, biggest talking point for TSM that's new is, yes, one, they're doing well in scrims. And also, I knew this for a while, but I kept it a secret. So Griggs' injuries with his wrists have actually been going on for a long while, and Acadian's been playing instead of Grig about, I would say, like two weeks before the announcement okay. was public. So that's been going on for a while. It wasn't very sudden. Um, they knew earlier on that um, Grig was having wrist problems, so they put in Acadian. And from what I heard, like, bootcamp has been really good. Acadian learned a lot and improved a lot because, um, frankly, he wasn't under the best coaching before. And Tony and also being around... Like, one thing about joining really good teams is... The really good players also know how the game should be played. And it's not just like the coach coaching you, like the your teammates will teach you a lot too. Hey, this is what my previous really top class jungler did. As a top class mid, this is what I want you to do as a jungler. And that really maybe, really maybe that was TSM's problem over the years. They were like, This is what our old jungler used to do, and then they were like, Oh damn it, we weren't supposed to say that. <laughs> well, but see I you joke, but I, I there's truth to that, I think. And that's there my is a big, bit, that's definitely. my biggest fear with this TSM roster is that Acadian who on the outset of you know of his rookie season showcased his mechanical prowess sure. and his aggressive play style could very much become the quintessential TSM jungler who mm-hmm. gets forced onto tanks and I mean doing what Grig did last split mm-hmm. but that's what Grig's supposed to do that's not what Acadian's supposed to do now the saving grace might be that they brought Zixen, who I believe is a very competent coach mm-hmm. and might finally be the administrative answer to the kind of cyclical uh, state of TSM, regardless of Just roster moves. They always, they're jungler. always the yeah. same goddamn team. <laughs> so I'm hoping that Zix might be able to break that spell, break that cycle and turn them into a different team using Acadian maybe as the the catalyst i don't know though so one thing that tony gets super underrated on tony everyone's like oh tony's game knowledge is so good tony's game knowledge is so good tony knows league of legends so well i think that's true but if you just listed game knowledge i would even confidently say i have better game knowledge than tony so one person i really want to compare to is weldon so a lot of people shit on weldon this on weldon i mean our host included doran but one thing that weldon is amazing at he's probably the best salesman ever and it's talked about a lot. We in, can agree upon that. That yeah. we can agree upon. So. I, it's talked about a lot in traditional sports, right? You need to have buy-in from players. You need to have sure. buy-in from players. Weldon always gets buy-in from his players because he's such a good salesman at selling his coaching method. Mm. Tony's also extremely good at that. If you hang out with Tony outside of like, I guess like a professional setting, you'll understand like how charismatic he is, how not like fun to be around, like, I don't mean fun as in like Tony will get like drunk off his head and then like he'll go do crazy shit. Tony's like just a fun and enjoyable person to be around and very charismatic. And I think that carries over a lot to his coaching where you want to listen to Tony and you want to buy whatever Tony's selling. So I think that's a very underrated aspect of Tony that I think a lot of people are going to see with the new TSM. The team really being on the same page with the coach and really being on the same page of one idea. And as for Acadian, one thing I do want to touch on is Acadian actually conflicted a lot with his mid laners when they were very demanding of him. Like Froggen and Acadian famously clashed on Echo Fox because Froggen wanted certain things, Acadian wanted certain things. Um, Acadian and Power of Evil clashed on Optic. 
I remember this one argument about op, um, power people going like, how the fuck can I play jungle? Like my jungler's not buying a pink ward. And then like they were having an argument about that. Like there is an argument. Like Acadian will not just be like, yes, Bjergsen, yes, Tony. He'll have his own questions. He'll have his own way that he wants to play. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but I don't think he's a jungler that's just going to get ran over and turn into another ward by TSM. I mean, that's good. That gives me high hopes, right? If he's not going to roll over and he's going to actually fight for, you know, to some degree, a play style that, that suits him along with the rest of the team, that'll be wonderful. And then, of course, there's Broken Blade, who mm -hmm. we have to, you know, who you got to talk about with TSM, which is just that, hey, this is, for, for me, I'm happy to see TSM investing in another piece of young talent as opposed to just pulling, you know, uh, already proven talent like Mithy and Sven last year mm -hmm. and having it uh, fall through. So I like that they're maybe taking a page out of um, C9's playbook. Granted, they were the ones who pulled Bjergsen over at a young age. Um, but pulling a page out of their book and saying, we're going to invest in young talent who might be super moldable, won't be so rigid in the way they play the game um and can be coachable but it all comes back to this is a guy who comes from a region where yes he was top class but what is top class in turkey you know where does that land you in in the echelon of top laners in north america mm -hmm. right he's gonna play someday licorice impact you know uh all of these guys i just don't know yet right so i think it's just it's very much a Jury's still out on that. We're going to have to wait for a few weeks of play to see if he even has what it takes to stack up mm -hmm. against some of the other top lane talent. So from what I heard and watching it now, he's someone that's actually very, very mechanically skilled and also really willing to learn. So I think eventually he will become a good player. It's just the pressure cooker of TSM is really harsh. So Centaurum was someone that's also mechanically talented. Not as willing to learn when I was working with him, but the pressure cooker of TSM really did a number on Centaurin, right? And then now he eventually became a great player on FlyQuest, and I think he was number three all, all pro in Summer Split, so he definitely became a good jungler on it, his own right, but it took so much time, and in some ways TSM damaged him, right? And it actually hindered his growth, so... Maybe the same yeah. thing happens to Broken Blade, or maybe we get another Bjergsen situation where TSM strikes gold and they have a franchise player that's very young that's going to be loyal to TSM for years to come. So I do think he's going to turn out to be a good player in the end, but I'm not sure what the process is going to look like this year and what he is going to look like also. That's why I, I, for me, like when I first saw this lineup, and obviously originally it had Greg listed as the jungler, like, okay, like some of the moves in isolation, like getting smoothie looks like a pretty good move. But I have to admit when I saw like, oh, they're using Greg again. And then as, as Dash said here, like, okay, you can hype Broken Blade all you want, but until I see him do it in the LCS, I, I don't know if he's going to be a really sick player or maybe he'll just be okay. So yeah. when I saw this team, I did kind of initially feel like I'm a bit out on this lineup. But to be fair, I actually think the main quality that will decide if it's going to be really good is the coaching aspect. Because as you said there, when you picked out like Acadian, this could happen to Broken Blade. If Zix can actually change the culture in that sense, as in you, you don't feel like you're playing for a team where if you fail, everyone's going to flim, including your teammates and the mm -hmm. expectations unreasonable. And to be fair, if you think of Zix and CLG, people might've argued they were too far the other way. They were too forgiving of people. So at least if someone might have that kind of background, because I feel like if you take, if you get rid of the problem, then you don't have to worry about the effect in the individual players. Then it's less about, can they stand up to the stream? Cause it won't be as big a deal, you know? I mean, yeah. TSM management loves Tony. I know Parth has held Tony in such a high regard for the longest time. Like even when I was coaching, I mean, Parth was always respectful. So he never said, oh, I wish we had Tony sure. as head coach instead of you, but he always t talked highly of Tony. And even talking to him, like, nowadays, like, Parth has held Tony in a high regard. And Andy also holds Tony in a high regard. So I think he's going to have a lot of backup from the well, management. Well, here's the thing. There's, it's not even just speculation. Because if you remember, obviously, the scandal when he joined TSM was that, like, two days before that log came out where he was, <laughs> like, you know, he, was, he essentially said, I'll rephrase it, like, you know, it sort of seems shit to play for TSM. And basically, yeah. he was alluding to exactly this. Like, yeah. the mad scrutiny you're under. Well, mm -hmm. if anything, at least he knows there's a problem. And so you'd hope he's going to address it. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and and the one aspect of this that we haven't talked about is 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 the fan base as well. Like part of that TSM pressure cooker is not just the team environment, is not just what you, yes. what is going on in the team house. It is the expectation of the brand, and this is you know this is what you get for being the biggest brand in North America and the winningest organization in the history of North America is that 
there's going to be fan expectation that when Broken Blade comes in, he will step up and perform, and he will be a top, top laner in all of the regions. Same thing with Santorin, same thing with Sven Skarin. And so it'll be interesting to see, yes, one of Zix can change the environment within the team. And then if TSM as an organization uh, can kind of, I don't know, like, kind of push that new environment into their fan base of like, hey, we, we're we still the best. We still want to be the best. That's always been our goal. But we're going to kind of reframe the way we think, the way we practice, and the way we improve. Uh, and if the fans can kind of get behind that and say, okay, I'm not going to eviscerate Broken Blade for his first two bad games in spring split. We're going to wait. You know, Maybe they can take a lesson from the C9 fans who all got super pissed off last summer. But ultimately, the coaching process you know, when left to, to its own devices came to fruition, mm -hmm. they were happier for it, right? Yeah. But that, oh my God, C9, oh, I'm course. surprised that fire. C9 <laughs> players, if I were on that team and I see my entire fan base, the entire fan base of my organization <clears throat> just, the, you know, up in arms over something that I also don't have a total control over because I'm just a player and when I'm subbed in and when I'm not is not entirely in my control, that would wear on my psyche quite a bit. And mm -hmm. so... There's a, there's a lot of moving parts for TSM this year. I'm very excited about uh, this roster, and I do think that it has potential to improve throughout the split, maybe top four for me uh, in spring split. That's about where I would probably put them power ranking-wise. Uh -huh. I probably I don't think, though. Oh, yeah, go on. I was going to say, I probably don't have as much scrim info as Loco, though, sure. so I know that he might be working with a little bit more... Uh, knowledge okay. at this moment but. yeah what, go on then Loco. what do you think in that sense with your behind the scenes info do you would you put them higher than he said there i i would never take scrims that seriously especially like this early in the well, except when you were in the coach of tsm oh, like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i really good things out of tsm camp really good things out of c9 camp a little bit concerning about tl camp that's just the generality of what i heard okay. Because the thing is, like along those lines of what Dash was talking about there with the fan base, I would hope that this last year where the team didn't make any of the finals has, I wouldn't say like humbled the fan base, but no, made it, them have more realistic <laughs> expectations. No, it got all the bandwagon fans to TL and C9. Oh, that helped for sure. But like part of the problem for me was like they did constantly, even the way they would speak about the team, contrast them with the teams that were always in the finals and was always winning the championships and made it to Worlds, etc. And the reason why that's actually very unfair in my opinion is because... Obviously, these years came one after another. They weren't all run side by side. Like, it's not like you could have taken the exact lineup from season seven and that would necessarily have won all the splits in season eight. Like, if you saw the way the franchising changed the way the composition of the league was and all this talent came in and then you had way deeper rosters of talent, like, there's not, nothing to say that even if they'd have kept double if they would have won the league. Maybe they wouldn't. Maybe they might have won one split and come third in the next. So it, it would have been some level of disappointment no matter what. Like, I'm definitely with people. Sure, if you get sold, oh, we're getting the best in the West spotlight. Sure, you think that's instant championships again. But mm. as we have seen with a number of very good TSM lineups, actually, sometimes the, the lineup on paper that looks sick is the one that fails. So, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, TSM fans, but welcome to the the world every other fan in the universe has had to exist for in for the last five years you don't always win it's a pretty good segue to tl because mm -hmm. tl is in exa that exact position of they took course. they took back-to-back -back wins in 2018 a, a, a poor international performance but then attempt to make changes here what seems to be two on paper major upgrades and yet as loco stated what we're hearing from behind the scenes is things aren't necessarily meshing so well or coming together just yet granted it's preseason, no of games course, have been played yeah. yet and they've got plenty of time to grow. But yeah, it's got to be a consideration. You're you're bringing Jensen over and you're bringing a former world champion in Core JJ into the bot lane. And yet there's potential that this team does worse than the previous L uh, Team Liquid roster did simply yes. because Synergy might not be there. Mm -hmm. I'd even throw in for that example, like for similar reasons as you can't contrast last year with this one identically, like a one for one, because it's not the same circumstances essentially. Well, part of the circumstance that changed, just like I said with the TSM example, is who you're playing. Like I have to say, as much as I give Team Liquid a lot of credit for winning both the splits and going to Worlds, when, like, if you remember the first split, that was the one where they struggled, but then they did an amazing run through the playoffs. They even had to yep. start in the first round, remember? The second one was the one where it was a joke. Like, they were just on top the whole time. Yeah. The only team we, that in we theory thought was going maybe to Cloud9 was going to challenge exactly. them. Cloud9 it... or, or TSM towards the end, 100 Thieves obviously fell apart. Like, it actually got a bit kind of whack the way they won the summer split. It looked too easy. It so did. I have to say, 
I don't think that they necessarily had the craziest competition that year. Whereas obviously this year, we're talking about some of these lineups look like they have upgraded. So actually, I wouldn't blame them either if it's way tougher to win, even with a better lineup. Mm -hmm. Very true. Very true. I mean, there's going to be championship hangover. Oh, like they won two splits in a row. Like it's always super <coughs> hard to keep like being staying really, really motivated, especially in League of Legends, because at least in traditional sports, there's off season. In League of Legends, once season starts in spring, like it's... 10 months are up yeah, up to 10 months of intense league of legends scrim like that's all your life's about for such a long time and when you went won to a championship went to worlds it's hard to keep that motivation i do think that's going to be a slight problem and also mm. last year's roster was very one-dimensionally good and it was very simple in how they played yes pull belt there impact sacrifice for double lift x mid d play around mid early and then play for that um, four man bottom dive and they did that throughout the entire year they struggled when they try to put impact on carries other than gp who can actually help out in the bot lane and who was really dive resistant and sometimes rumble but they had that one play style that worked really well for them and they mastered it and they did a really good job with it now what's it going to look like this year definitely mid lane isn't going to be as utility as before and mid lane's going to draw in more resources i mean pobelter himself he said on tl i was told to play this way and now sure. on FlyQuest, I'm going to be unleashed. So that Pobelter himself confirmed that's what the staff wanted or the team wanted. I actually did a, a, an interview with Doublelift recently. That's going to come out uh, maybe next week. Like it'll come out fairly soon. So one of those reflections ones. And basically when he talks about this era of Team Liquid, he even says that actually he himself realized when he saw the lineup, like, oh, wait, this is basically a team just built so that I'm supposed to be the star player. So it's like, but he even said at first when he saw that, his first thought was sort of like, shit, this is going to look bad if I'm not the best player then. But then he actually thought, because funny enough, he actually said, I don't know if he was just saying this to be nice to me because I was in the interview, but he did say that because in my video, I said that if you are like a superstar player, the way you reframe it is, well, that's what I want. Yeah, give me all the, give me everything I need, all the facilities, the, all the players that can support me, set me up. And obviously, if I think I'm the best player, that's when I'm going to take over the game. So it, I think he was able to do that. But like you say, it was such a one-dimensional aspect. I, even if they'd have brought that lineup into this year, I don't know if they would be the best. I think you could make a strong case they would they'd be in the pack, but I don't think they would be the clear cut best. So I think making the moves was like a it was like a well timed gamble. Like they yeah. seem on paper like the right moves to make. Very on brand for TL. I'm I mean I'm super excited for this roster if it mm -hmm. ends up coming together. Um, I mean I have some concern. I have there's some positives, some negatives, right? The positives are. As you mentioned, they were a very one-dimensional team last year. Okay, they now have the option to produce more strategies centered around oh. Jensen specifically. That said, uh, to hit on the point of like Pobelter having to play super defensive or sacrificial essentially in support of Doublelift, Jensen showed us this last year that he's very much capable mm -hmm. of playing that same role. So sure. whether it's Zillion every game, Karma mid, or he's playing Oriana in a supportive fashion. There are, or Galio, there are ways that he can still fill that and they can index into that strategy around double if. But by the same token, if mid lane is superbly relevant, I do believe they could play around Jensen as their solo carry. So really it comes down to how does this team work together and how do they decide at any given moment which strategy they're going to take? And will the superstars be able to take a step back because I, I love what you were saying, Thorne, about how as a superstar, I want your mentality to be put it all on me. Give me the resources. Let me win the game. You give the ball to the best guy on the court when there are five seconds left on the clock. You do not give it. You might bring in the one random shooter. Okay. But, <laughs> but generally you give it to the star player and you have him drive to the hoop or whatever it is. Just mm -hmm. let him go one-on-one. -on -one. Same thing here. If I'm double lift, and we end up in a situation where my coach thinks the best way to play is to draft through the mid lane this game and play through Jensen. But my mentality as a top player, a star player, and you know one of the most decorated players in the NALCS wants all the resources. Can I take that back seat? Can I let someone else have the glory for the sake of the victory? And, and I think that is something that TL will struggle with this whole split just because of the pedigree of the five players on the roster. Yeah, I mean, Doublelift yeah. did it before on TSM, but he was stepping into someone else's house as a guest. He was a guest of Bjergsen's house. Now, yeah. someone else is being a guest of Doublelift's house. Is he going to be able to show the same kind of, I guess, sacrificialness, like humbleness, whatever you want to call it? He's been capable, right. but is he going to do it this year? That's the big question. 
The thing is, if you look at his history, and this is another thing actually that we address a little bit in this interview, is like one of the reasons I always had a real tough time in like the lineups that Double Left was in in CLG when they never won and they were always just going out in the first round of the playoffs is like as much as his teammates would be like, oh, well, you know, he's you know, he's too selfish and he doesn't like want to do what we want to do. He doesn't trust us. I also used to think like, to be fair, it's really hard to trust people who then let you down. That's what makes you lose trust. That's why the meme is like, you know, that, this is the reason I can't trust people anymore. And they show you some like scene from anime where like your favorite character dies or something. Mm -hmm. it, that's that's the big problem. So the key thing is, it's a lot easier to trust someone who's also a superstar player. Who's mm -hmm. also, in, in fact, obviously the thing about Jensen that's cool. I think this is the the coolest part of the narrative is that Double Lift's got all the LCS championships that Jensen desperately wants. Yep. Jensen's had all the world's playoffs that Double Lift <laughs> desperately wants in his career. Like they both know if we don't fuck this up we can both really help each other out here i've yep. got what you want you've got uh, what i want and, and i've got two <laughs> world champions on their team so they better show up yeah and then the other guys are like listen we've sort of done all that so if you guys <laughs> just hurry the fuck up actually <laughs> but court jj court jj when he was in the north american lcs was horrible he that was the dignitas uh like exit season yeah. right yes. And so, funnily enough, while he has a world championship, he probably still wants to to win the LCS split and hold sure. that trophy. <laughs> I think that's yeah. actually something beneficial for TL because one thing that can happen when you bring over Korean superstars to North America is North America is a fucking joke. Like, who is this double lift guy? If he played in Korea, he'd get stomped. But Core JJ has experience against double lift, and he knows it is hard to make it in NA, and like how good double lift has been in NA. So I actually thought. Core JJ, as good of a fit Jensen is, it's hard to say Core JJ is a better pickup because, I mean, it's fucking Jensen and it's mid lane. Like, you're not going to get better than that. Core JJ right. is also an incredibly hyped pickup that's going to enable Double to do a lot more and kind of take some burden off his shoulder. With Biofrost and Ole, I do feel like Double was always teaching, always kind of leading. This is like the first time where Double Lift, outside of like Aphromo, where he can be like, my support is better than me. I trust my support to the fullest. So Loco, now I'm curious, given given some of the reservations you've heard mm -hmm. about TL coming into the split, how are you power ranking them? Because I, I, to me, it's the on paper, mm -hmm. the roster you want. Yeah, it's gotta be number one. Yeah, it has right. to be number one because okay. I mean, they upgraded. Other teams did upgrade also, but no one can really challenge them. Like potentially, like if everything clicked for Hundred Thieves, maybe Hundred Thieves. Everything clicked for TSM, maybe TSM. But TL has a lot less questions to answer than any other team does. And over a long course of period, the team with the best roster usually does well, unless it's TSM. I've got them number one at the end of the split, but I have them losing the first game to C9 on opening day. I am very possible. C9, super hot in scrims, was boot camping in Korea for a long while. Like probably, they've been prepping longer than any other team. So C9 mm -hmm. being like strong at the start of the season, doesn't, it's not gonna surprise me at all. Yeah. Okay. Well, since you mentioned, like, at the moment, like, the three big teams people pick out are Team Liquid, TSM, 100 Thieves, mainly, mm -hmm. because you look at some of the other squads, like, I, I, as much as C9 was very good last year, you do lose, like, in theory, your franchise player. That has to, you have to take a knock immediately in a kind of a power ranking sense, you know? If they turn out to be great, great. So let's talk about 100 Thieves then. So this is a team that, obviously, mm -hmm. you can't really even compare them to the team last year because the changes are just so overwhelming. So... Obviously, they've replaced both the troubled AD carry position, again, with someone who's been a world champion in Bang. And then, bizarrely, they took out Ryu, who's obviously Prolly's boy for a long time, and a guy who he played with and saw, in theory, someone you'd think would get Prolly's system. And they brought in Hui from CLG. I th quite frankly, I think that was quite a shocking transfer, actually. I mean, if you remember, Loco, you were implying that, like, Hui would probably stay with CLG, right? No, I, well, behind the scenes, I knew who he would leap. Um, they were they were looking to switch both solos, CLG. Um, oh, okay. So the only one that was up in the air was top lane because they wanted different top laners, but they none of the top laners wanted to settle for CLG's price or CLG the team, and yeah. Okay. Got so what, what are you what are you feeling about this hundred thieves lineup dash? Um, I'm extraordinarily excited for Bang Afro Mu, um, as a bot lane because I think that Afro, who has been lauded as one of the better macro minds in the LCS, uh, will be well paired with a Korean ADC. Typically, Korean bot lanes, one of the things they're most known for is their ability to survive lane, right? Is to is to farm, not die to those 4v2s or 5v2 bot lane dives, which we very much could see uh, in the opening weeks with the given meta at the moment and the pace of the game. I think that the two of them 
will serve very well as a stable bot lane, which they did not have last year because Cody was a liability, right? There were deaths in the bot lane. Even at his best, he's just an erratic player, right? Yeah, yeah it's just, yeah, he's not on Bang's It's kind caliber. of just his thing. Yeah, <laughs> and so I think that there will be a lot more stability coming from the bot lane, and that will also unlock Afro Mu to have a little bit more oversight over the rest of the game, is my, my hope. Um, I think that who he will therefore serve this team fairly well. Um, you could maybe argue that Ryu in his highest of highs was better, right? In his, in those like stati statistical outlier performances that he had, he's just phenomenal. Uh, but his lows were also lower. So who he will be more of a middle ground player, um, playing more of a supportive role maybe making roams to that bot lane, which I, again, in the way that we think the meta will play out right now with visitation to the bot lane, I think that that will serve them well. Um, so I think this will be a solid squad to start. I, Onda was a fine performer last year, but never impressed. I mean, he played like Poppy Jungle half of his games, and it's hard to die on that champion, um, and you can turret dive no problem. So I don't really know what to expect out of him in particular. And if he is weak and who he never being a lane dominant mid laner, that's my one fear is that their mid jungle collapses and gets abused, right? If the two of them can't control the mid lane vision and then therefore support the bot lane, they might not get anywhere. But I do think overall the bot lane is going to be, you know, leagues better. And ideally that'll allow Aphromoo to have more control over the game as a whole. And then it never hurts, again, to have a two-time world champion in Bang with his just knowledge and understanding of the way the game of League of Legends is played uh, to just kind of have influence over the team and their strategy. Hmm. So, I mean, he comes from the best team in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Flat out, he comes from the best team in the world. So it's hard, it's hard not to index into Bang's game knowledge. And he's not like Scout or Sky that was like in SKT for a year and then like left or like even like Izun, he was like a core part of SKT's dynasty and one of the reasons why SKT was so good. So exactly. Yeah, very good resume. I mean, speaking overall about 100 Thieves, I'll go top to bottom. I mean, someday what to say, potentially the best top laner um, last year. I mean, I, I want to kind of skip over him, not because he's boring, but he's just been good and he's going to be a rock. He's good. There's, exactly. there's not much to talk about. So on the interesting... I think Onda towards the later, um, in late later of last year, like especially during Worlds, I thought he was either the best performer or the second best performer on 100 Deep. So I think Onda's good, and also watching him in in houses, Onda was especially good mechanically mm -hmm. and way he was able to communicate and speaking a little 200 Deep. Onda's developing more in that communicated role, but he's gonna get covered up a lot because of Huhi and Afro's shot calling that they're gonna bring from CLG like the old school CLG and also who he just being a very vocal mid laner, I think it's going to make it really easy for Onda. I think Onda is a very, very, very good development piece for 100 Thieves that's actually paid off so much for them. So now we move on to mid lane for who he there, who he is like a bit question mark for a lot of people because people rate who he pretty lowly. And I do think in terms of like flashiness and in terms of what mid laners are usually rated on, like how good are you in lane? Like how good are you in team fights? How good are you on these traditional mid lane, like, AP carries. Hui's actually not the best at that. Hui plays best when he can build priority really easily through stuff like Talia rides that can like push the lane really well and most infamously Aurelian Soul and affect the map. What Hui's really good at is communication and enabling other people and being very like helpful. And I think that's gonna help Onda a lot, and I think that's actually gonna help bot lane a lot too. As for Bang and Afro, like watching Bang play in solo queue and just hearing about them, like they seem like they're going to be an incredibly strong duo. The only duo that you really want to talk about with it is probably going to be uh, Zben and Smoothie and Doublelift and Core JJ. Those are probably going to be the top three bot lane duos. So where I see the problem for this team is actually the mid jungle 2v2 early game. If that, that's always been so important and a crucial part of League of Legends, and that's been one of who he's downfalls, how his early game mid jungle 2v2s went. Whenever he picks these priority champions and they get destroyed in the 2v2, like you have no coming back. Like you're so <coughs> dependent on playmaking. And I think that's kind of going to be the story of this team. They are going to be very dependent on playmaking, but they're going to have a very, very strong backbone in bang and team fights and someday in team fights and someday in split push. So this is a team with incredibly good strengths and some holes that they're going to need to do creative problem solving to be able to fix. But I have them number two in my power rankings because mm. I think the other teams are 
I mean, a lot of teams have questions to answer, and 100 Deeps definitely have big questions to answer, but their strengths are just incredible. Yeah, I'm... Do you know, by the way... Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, just to follow up on the power ranking, I'm TL1 at yeah. the end of the split, then I'm C9, actually, then yeah. I'm 100 Thieves, then I'm TSM, so I think we're flip-flopping mm -hmm. the C9 Yeah, thieves. that's my top four, too, also, yeah. but... Um, I, yes. Loco, do you know much about the personality of Bang? Like, what type of a person he is? As you know, as a player, does he get rattled? Does he get annoyed if people don't work hard? What type of a person is he? Do you know? It's actually hard for me to say because Bang is someone that's incredibly polite to me because I was also older than him, and also I right. was kind of his tombe where I played eighty carry before Bang played eighty carry. So in a sense, like Bang learned. It's he didn't learn from me, but it's like. Hey, here's someone that's older than you that played the same kind of position that you did. So Bang just showed me incredibly amount of respect anytime we interacted in Korea and I haven't interacted in, with him in North America. So from my point of view, he's just someone incredibly polite, but that's just, that can be a face that he puts on or that can be his actual self. It's just, it's hard for me to right. just tell you guys, hey, Bang's just an incredibly polite player because of the circumstances. Fair enough. Because that was like one of the, if you remember when we talked about this lineup was before they had Hui. Like this is where we didn't know who the mid laner was. Like maybe they were going to keep Ryu. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were going to, oh, actually we knew they were going to change Ryu because they had the two import the import rules. Yeah. So like, but we, since we didn't know at the time <clears throat> and people even thought maybe they'll sign Paul Belter or something like this was actually a real move that could have happened. I was a lot more down on the roster when I didn't know it would be Hui. And this is the reason why. Is because the downside, I think, of people like Bang, at least the little I know about him from outside and seeing some of the stream clips, is that type of Korean player who has been at the very top level, and crucially, they've had like a long period of success. They tend to be incredibly critical of themselves and their teammates. That's like the environment you foster. I mean, it's funny, we were saying about the TSM example. I think that's just more difference between Western people and as individuals and, and Eastern people, because in, it seems like Koreans especially thrive when it's like that sort of environment of like, let's all keep each other on our tours and make sure no one's like slipping up even if it's something as simple as we're winning the game but this guy's like slacking on his own practice you know and eventually that'll catch up to us so like people are very very sort of critical of other people in that sense and not in as much of a friendly way as you might get in some of the western team houses so i actually was concerned when i first saw this lineup like what would they do if the team starts badly like it's going really terribly and then bang's just thinking like what, what have i done like i've joined a team where i can't communicate with some of these guys obviously it's very unlikely they're all going to have the same work ethic that he, they had in the sk telecom house when he's over there I, mm. I could have seen that going very very badly but to be honest now that they've added hui i think the saving grace on that angle is that when you look at this lineup where are the egos? Like they've got the two Koreans, someday and Bang, who are already good at their roles. Mm -hmm. Afro Mu to some degree, but he is the captain. And if anything, he's been known as a very great teammate. And then the two people who you might have questions about, like maybe they'll underperform at times, Ander and Huhi, they're actually pretty known as not particularly outspoken people. They seem like people who, because of where they've gone in their careers, would be very open to being coached and would actually be kind of going along with the groups. So I think actually I'm not really that concerned about that angle as much now that they got Huhi, because it I've always said about who he is. Like, if you try and pit him as a star player, then I'm going to criticize him all day and it's going to make it sound like I think he's shit. But if yeah. you're going to put him in the role where your best players are going to be top and ADC, and I just want someone to play the mid lane properly, do what the coach says, play his champion appropriately, don't take big risks. Actually, he can do that job all day long. He's a, he's a very respectable player in that sense, very serviceable mid laner. So I think generally, yeah, actually, the lineup looks like it should shape up pretty well. I can't really see where the flaws are, except maybe, as we said, Anders a jungler. But to be fair, I can't really judge him too harshly for last year because yeah. he wasn't playing with the proper 100 Thieves most of the time. So I don't really blame the jungler when you don't have the real lineup. Yeah, no, he came in mid split, replacing Meteos. So you're, you already have a bar that you're, you know, set that you're probably not going to hit as a rookie. And then actually, as Loco said, his world's performance should not be ignored because, again, considering that he's a rookie, he actually stepped up pretty well, mm -hmm. right? Like you expect on an international stage most of the time that a rookie is going to, they're going to degrade, they're going to fall to pieces a little bit. And so even just you know putting up the consistent performances that he had in the NALCS up during the world championships does give me some hope that with proper coaching and a full year under his belt he might actually become a very you know a very practiced and very solid uh, uh jungler speaking about it sounds like we're all pretty high on this team though yeah I mean, speaking about outspoken people on 100 Thieves I would say the three most people that are outspoken on the 100 Thieves organization are Afro Prolly and nade shot and i think they're very much in line so yes they're gonna be a team that's at least unified if they lose it's gonna be like problems in the game not like 
personality yeah. conflicts or anything like that. It's just they weren't good enough or they didn't mesh their play styles in the right way and they weren't capable of maybe playing core uh, meta champions like Azir or something like that. It's not going to be like, oh, people started fighting and this team blew up. The other angle as well that I had was like my other concern when I knew that probably Ryu gets replaced is probably has only had two mid laners in his whole career. He's had Febovan and Ryu. That's it, basically. Like these are the guys he's had, he's had Ryu for a long time. You know, if I'd, like, off the top of my head, I think we're talking like maybe six splits, maybe even more. This guy, this guy has been his mainstay for a long time. So clearly he liked what that guy did. That guy understood him on some level. I mean, not literally in terms of eloquent English language, but they clearly had like an understanding of how we want to play the game because he brought this guy with him over to any when a lot of people would have said, ah, oh, he's washed up, forget about him, you know, just leave him behind. And he had some relative level of success, which to me shows that whatever you wanted that guy to do, he could do for you. I, so I was a big concern. Yeah, go on. I'll say this. So give me, when... give me the criticism of Ryu. No, 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 it's not a criticism. It's how much Ryu and probably like, like each other. So okay. when I was on Golden Guardians, um, I really, I wanted Ryu and I talked to Ryu and then we got into like a verbal agreement about, hey, Ryu's going to join us. When Prolly came into the equation, like Ryu was extremely apologetic. He he was like, I'm so sorry. Like, what is it? But he went he went with Prolly. Like, we, oh, right. I see. He was going to be, he was yeah, there before. We, we, had, we had a handshake right. and Ryu broke that handshake for Prolly. I mean, I don't blame him. It's just like their bond and like how much Ryu and Prolly trust each other is super fucking strong. Fair enough. But, so, but the, the difference is what counteracts that to me is that the real person you want to be on the same page with you if you're probably is Aframu because this is yeah. the guy who's the leader. This is the guy with the championships. This is the guy who was the MVP of the league at one point last year. So mm -hmm. if anything, the synergy people might be missing there is, I've always said this, one of the reasons also why, I, in a way, it's, it sounds like you're downplaying Huey, but he was clearly at his best when he was with Aframu. Mm -hmm. And I know I, I go, I definitely like for the sake of banter, push it a little bit and make out like he just puppet mastered him. Like the analogy I always give of Mata and Looper, you know, like Looper, mm -hmm. my, my joke always is the second Looper left Mata's team, like the next day he just didn't know what that, what is this teleport key? I keep pressing it, but right. I don't teleport at the right time. Why is that anymore? I used to be a best at this, pressing that key. Yeah, because some guy was telling you to press the key. So my point is who he was at his best with all those weird, like that very bizarre style he had when they got that first championship team in CLG, where he was like, the mid laner, but he was like the guy, it was almost like his job was like to zone in a team fight and to like absorb, like it's it's like he was using the fact that you're supposed to see a mid laner and go kill him quickly, it's the mid laner. But then he, he was the distraction anyway, and they they wanted you to do that. So the AD carry was just hitting you all day long. Like I mean, he's, he's, he's a, back with his man. He's a mid laner who doesn't play mid lane, he plays the map. <laughs> um, but, but in order to play the map, right, he needs to have that communication with the rest of his, with the rest of the the pieces of the team that also play the map, and that's the support and the jungler. And so that's back to Loco's point around the. I think the weak point for Hundred Thieves could be the two v two jungle mid, mm -hmm. um, but having that existing synergy and you know years of experience with Afro Mu as the leader of the team should hopefully counteract you know. Uh, a lot of that and and allow him to 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 return to to his former form of being of course, in, yeah. being an aide to the rest of the team because right. the thing is like i know when here's the thing if you were doing like a list like top 10 players at a position in theory when you make that sort of list it's supposed to be like individual ability so you shouldn't judge like well is he a shot caller is he captain you know, like that stuff in theory is like an intangible but when you're talking about a team Absolutely, those intangibles, if you know about some of them, have to be taken into consideration. And I have to say, I have noticed just from reading people's responses, whenever an, an Afro Moo team does badly, people want to be like, they're so eager to be like, ah, oh, he's done, right? I'm calling it. He's been bad this split. It's like you have to realize, guys, people like Afro Moo, even if they play individually bad, could actually be incredibly impactful in your team because of their ability to be a captain, their ability to lead the game, to make reads in the game. You might win a game where individually it was the other players who got the kills, but if this guy told them to do it or made the right read, or even when he was behind, knew how to mentally play through that, that can be insanely impactful in itself. So I feel like he's one of those players. It's the same thing with Mithy, because I know a lot of people who just saw Mithy last year are going to think, ah, he's garbage, he's terrible now. That's the reason why when we did that EUL episode, I said, I guarantee at one point in time when his individual skills catch up again, because of what he brings alongside the individual skills, guys like that are worth their weight in gold, in my opinion. You have to have the right team for him, sure, but whoever gets them and it's the right team gets to benefit from that, from that lottery ticket, as it were. Um, um, yo, Dash, I know you had like a stop at 4 p.m. Is it like a hard stop or do you want to squeeze in two no, more No, no, not a hard stop. We okay. can... 
I mean, right. then let's, well, how about finish. this then? There's so many te teams that we haven't talked about then. How about pick one? What's another one that you, would be interesting to talk about here? Um, well, okay. I think Optic is an interesting <laughs> squad. <laughs> Um, so well, I, I think I think I think Cloud Nine is low hanging fruit simply yes. because because they lost Jensen. So then you're talking about Nisky having Nisky aspect, yeah. right? Nisky coming in and trying to fill those shoes. But again, to me, there's not much discussion there. It's just, hey, Nisky was terrible when he was on Envy in North America. Granted, he barely played half the split because they were sure. also playing Ninja, so he never really had time to prove anything. But the last time we saw him in North America, he was not great. Then he goes over to Europe. And now he's the savior of Splice. And all we hear and see is how he's the only real functioning carry on that team. And when he pops off, he absolutely has the potential to, to control a game by himself and win it single-handedly. Will that translate back over to Cloud9? I hope so. He's got some strong players around him. And, uh, you know, we all know that Reaper is a incredibly proficient coach. So maybe he can mold him and he can be, uh, you know, a fantastic middle laner and a you know, they're the most Plus, if he isn't, he'll just get benched. So problem <laughs> right, yeah, and he'll just get benched and boom, Golden Glue's in. Um, you know, and then and then as Loco said, we've been hearing that they're the team that's been working together the longest up to this point. So out the gate, I expect them to be solid. But that's why I don't think Cloud9 is that interesting a conversation. Mm -hmm. So Optic for me, what's interesting there is, why did you pick up two junglers that both deserve a start starting spot in the NALCS? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I, don't it, I don't get it. To me, I think this is... I say this with like z with zero behind the scenes knowledge of how that relationship is going right now, but to me that's just I don't see how this is successful long term. Pick pick the one whose style you want to play. Use that guy. Also save yourself some money right. for not paying the other dude's salary. And then I think Crown as a pickup is just incredibly intriguing, right? Mm -hmm. Um and which jungler would Crown work better with when we talk about the importance of jungle mid synergy? Is it going to be with Medios? Is it going to be with Dardoch? I don't know. Okay, I'm going to shed backlight on, or I'm going to shed light on what happened during the off season. Um, so Echo Fox, as you guys might expect, was incredibly messy during the off season. So there was a chance that Echo Fox roster ends up Huni and Peanut, and once that wow. Peanut thing fell through, Huni fell through, and then Huni went to Clutch, and then Echo Fox was like, "What the fuck?" So and they were. All <laughs> No, the reason I just laugh is yeah. because like I understood, I understood everything. Everything made sense until yeah. you were like, but that fell through. So Hooney went to clutch. It's like, I, Hooney, wait, are you aware of the concept that like you're supposed to go wet that place that makes more sense? That makes less sense. Like, uh -huh. okay, anyway, but that's Hooney's mind, which I'll not attempt to intuit at any point in time. Uh -huh. So yeah, keep going. So Hooney went to clutch, and then now Echo Fox's option was potentially Phoenix Dardock because Phoenix and Dardock used to right. play together and they they <coughs> worked together, or Phoenix Brush. So now that was also a question mark. So Dardock throughout the whole time is like, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Because from the start, Dardock thought he was going to be released and Optic showed interest. And then Echo Fox was like, eh, yeah, you talk to Dardock. Maybe we'll give you Dardock. And then the whole Huni Peanut thing fell through. And then they're like, oh man, my, we might need to hold on to Dardock. And then the Rush Phoenix thing became a possibility. So they're still holding on to Dardock until the Rush Phoenix thing happens. And then Optic from their point of view is like, what the fuck is going on? Dude, we need a jungler. Are we going to fucking get Dardock or not? And then they're like, okay, we might not get Dardock at this point. Let's go get Meteos. And even when they are signing and talking to Meteos, they're telling them, hey, potentially we're going to sign Dardock to Academy or Dardock as a backup. And then they sign Meteos and then Echo Fox finishes their Rush and Phoenix situation. So now it's Rush Phoenix and then Dardock is completely free. And then at that point, Dardock has no, almost no option but to go to Echo or Optic, the team he was originally talking to. Because of yeah. all the messy stuff that happened. But gotcha. Meteos is the starting jungler on their website right. and from their starting lineup like that they posted. And also... And I, think that's, I think that's the right pick. Mm -hmm. I think that's the right starting pick is, is Meteos. Just An another messy thing. They let Arrow go during the offseason. They didn't want to get Arrow. They wanted to get someone else or they want to take their roster a different direction. They didn't find anyone better than Arrow. They signed Crown. They're like, holy fuck, we need another Korean AD carry. And they picked up Arrow. It's kind of like the Phoenix situation, but definitely a lot less drama, but still just as confusing for both parties. You know, I'd never thought of this angle, actually, until you were describing it there. But 
as many like I, I i'm just going to go ahead and give you a spoiler in case anyone hasn't seen any of the shows we did in the off season like, i think the optic gaming lineup is like a fucking train wreck like i could see this going so badly in so many different ways like even some of the strengths i think cancel each other out but i will say this one unexpected angle i think is actually pretty legit when i think about it now is by ending up with both meteos and dialogue two players who have themselves had their own let's just say disciplinary issues or they've been difficult teammates at times one of the things that has always been a problem in North America until Cloud9 managed it was to successfully sub a star player, a guy who knows he's one of the best at his role. Because the problem always was when you sub that guy, first of all, part of him thinks that, well, fuck you for subbing me. You know, like I'm the starting yeah. player. Like, why am I not playing? He's going to resent you, which is very different again from the Korean method. The Korean guy would do the opposite. He'd be like, what have I done wrong? Like, how do I get back in the team? You know, it's a, it's a totally different response. But more importantly, as Dardock himself knows only too well, and as I pointed out in the Breaking Point documentary, if you bench Dardock, so we're using Dardock as the example here, but obviously he's also the specific case. You, he can always just think in the back of his mind, all right, you're benching me to teach me a lesson, are you? Uh, we'll see who learns the lesson after the next few games where whoever <laughs> you're putting instead of me plays, right? Because odds are, with how important a jungler is, you're probably going to lose those games. Mm -hmm. So even if you come to me and you try to say, like, you've learned your lesson, right? I'm going to be like, oh, I'm sure we've all learned our lessons. You know, now let me back in. Here's the difference, right? If you have both of those players who are very competent junglers, that doesn't exist anymore, actually. Like now, not only can you make them compete for the spot, but in theory, you could also make it so that now if you need to remove me, you'll say we've got Dardock coming in. He's, yeah. He might be better than you, mate. Like, mm -hmm. meanwhile, if you had Dardock, say you go with him as the starting jungler later, you've got the most experienced jungler of all time from NA behind him. Like, that's actually a quite a... They've done it inadvertently, but that actually could be a solution to one of the few flaws those players have shown. That is very true. That is very true. And, uh, when it comes to the roster as a whole as well, like, I, I'm excited. I, like... Arrow, he's such a tough player to nail down because he was an MVP mm -hmm. at one point. And, and then, you write, like, let's remember his very first split in in the LCS. We we're like, holy crap, this guy is a god. Uh, you know, and listen, definitely. guys, it's really hard to steal AD carry, uh, to steal MVPs as an AD carry. They don't normally get to steal that in those awards, that position, you know. I mean, I just early. remember, I just remember his good. team fight. His team, sure. his team fight positioning was what really impressed yes. me. I just found that it was it was never Arrow getting caught out, and he was always seemingly seemingly able to deal the maximum amount of damage that you would expect out of him in in every fight. And then everything started to go downhill, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And now and now we have to determine or decide is that a product of the team around him? You know, basically not giving him the option or the circumstance to perform or is that because he individually is getting worse or is not as good so dash i know you know for a fact have you ever been to a p1 party uh i can't say that i have i usually steer clear okay the e4 party legal the esports parties where there are if people, only local could people, have learned that lesson people many years like, ago. People, yeah. people seven to ten years yes. my junior there, okay. I'm like, yeah. Well, P1, when P1 was in the LCS, <laughs> they, were, okay. They, okay. they were known for their parties. Like, they, they, like, they just had parties right in the start of LCS. Let's have a party. We didn't get relegated. Let's have a party. Um, yeah. Off, like, one week break. Let's have a party. Like, P1 just had parties all the time. I mean, I like the parties. I appreciate it. They were just... Some teams that were the party team, like Dignitas was a party team. Like Dignitas right. par had parties all the time. P1 had parties all the time. And being on a party team, it's one thing to be on a party team and for it to actually go through and be a party team, the management has to okay it because you're holding the party in the house. So yeah. I generally don't like party teams. I like going to the parties, but I don't think party teams are good for players or people working on those teams. And I think... P1 being Arrow's first team, like, Arrow actually really loosened up in a bad way. He lost a mm. lot of what makes, like, Koreans really good. Like, kind of that dedication and kind of that grind, and he lost that. And he somewhat naturalized to NA and, like, normalized, so... But do you think then that Crown joined him? <laughs> yeah, but do you think Crown joining the roster might help him revert? Because if you have another, you know, top top tier, decorated Korean mid laner coming over... I mean, Crown has had his ups and downs, uh, but a very solid player uh, for all intents and purposes. Him moving into the team environment might motivate, you know, Arrow, might give him that link back to discipline, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and whatnot. Um, so I'll be curious to see how the two Koreans kind of mesh and, and push each other. But you cannot ignore that they still have Dokla in the top lane. 
mm-hmm. who, who, yes, they won some games through him last year. I, I don't want to downplay uh, that he individually had, like, solo won them games with, you know, split pushers like Yorick. But I do not think by any stretch of the imagination that Dokla, like double lift, can be the sole win condition and sole carry uh, of a team. And so I really worry about the weak in the top side of the map for optic um as a whole and this is and this is forgetting that arrow has been an underperformer even if yeah. we assume he returns to form you still have to deal with the top side of the map yeah dude getting discipline back is really hard and once you like in- start enjoying stuff like food in na like also just living like a certain lifestyle like in korea everyone around you is grinding and if you don't grind like you're gonna get cut so you're forced to have discipline it's not even a choice like you personally don't get to make the choice to have discipline or not if you don't have the choice the team will make the decision for you you're out and outside of that environment to get that discipline again it's incredibly hard there's like that's why players like Bjergsen are so revered in NA like it's so easy to be distracted and he remains so disciplined throughout all these years and yeah I'm not sure if Arrow can get back to that discipline even with Crown I think Crown's just gonna feel frustrated this is a player when he went to Worlds and went to both playoffs, he had 4,000 solo queue games played. 4,000. The average pro ends with 2,000 or 2,500. This guy had 4,000 solo queue play- games played. When he went to Worlds, he went to all the playoffs. The only tournament he didn't go to was MSI. Yeah. I, like, so, yeah, this, this one angle is just really captured Locals' imagination. Like, in Locals at the week, you know, the opening week of the LCS, and he's like using his fucking scouter. What's that? Crown's had over 9,000 practice games. I, I'm all in on Optic. I just changed my mind. Yeah. So, just to put this in context, I just did some quick math. So, 4,000 um, times 35, right? Average 35 minute game. That's not even your Q, okay. you know, queuing and post game screen. Right. And then divided by 60 for number of hours. That's 2,333 hours of solo queue that he played. That's insane. To On top of it. scrims. This is not academy players like missing right. scrims. This is a LCK players, full scrim block, full playoffs, full worlds, 4,000 solo queue. That's just, and that's assuming just a very average length game. That's 97 days of game time. 97 days of game time. Just put that in context for everyone of, yeah, what some Koreans and the top, top level I mean, players some, will some dedicate pe- to. But. Some people are saying like, oh, Magic Felix had like 5.3K games or some Academy players had 5K games. Of course they can have 5K games because they don't have the fucking scrim blocks. Crown had full scrim block and went to playoffs and he still managed this. This guy is an insane grinder. Never heard yeah, of anyone yeah, yeah, doing yeah. anything close to that. I think Optic's ceiling, like if everything goes well, goes right for this mm-hmm. team, their ceiling is four, maybe three. Um, I think that their floor is 10th, though. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that there is a real possibility this team is 10th. Echo Fox might really give them a run for their money in 10th place. But I do think that this is one of the more volatile teams in my preseason ranking. Like, I have no way to nail down where, where they'll finish. The problem with problem this, my, or, the problem with this team is like when things start falling apart, Meteor Stardock start falling apart, causing problem. Like Crown falling apart. Like where's the glue that's holding this team together? Zebu team. No offense to Zebu team. I honestly don't know his coaching history that well, but he's a very new coach. He he was a caster that turned coach. Mm-hmm. This is not like a new like a one year two coach team job to like hold this team together. And there's no glue pieces. You have so much rookies and you have veterans that come with so much baggage. Also, it's Crown comes with a lot of baggage. Meteos comes with a lot of baggage. Dardot comes with a lot of baggage. If this team fails, I don't think it's necessarily on the coach. It's on whoever put this roster together. It's going to be an incredibly hard team to like actually make fun so. I think it does go the other way, though, that if this team can actually succeed, I'll give a lot of credit to Zabatine, actually, sure. because when you look at this team on paper, my biggest problem with it is, like I said, the biggest strength, the only clear strength is the jungle position. And if a jungler doesn't have anyone to work with, I mean, he's basically impotent. You know, you're like this isn't like season five or whatever, where Rosh is just going to 1v9 the whole game like that. That area is not here at the moment. So if you look elsewhere on the team, like who's he going to help? Right. The problem is every single lane has question marks. Like, as he said about Dorkler, like, the big problem with all the laners for me is, like, if you'd made a lineup and then you told me any of these three players is the last guy you got me for the lineup, I'm like, ah, that's not bad. Yeah, we could work with that. Let's see how that goes. But it's right. like, wait, those are all the laners? So, like, 
inexperienced top laner who hasn't really broken through and shown like a top level performance. Okay, we'll, we'll forget about him for the moment. World champion, but coming off a terrible year, and even his own team basically has like lost faith in him. Korea doesn't seem to want him. To be right. fair, okay, that happened to Ryu in the past. You know, he resurrected his career. There's not impossible he could turn out to be really good, but at the moment it's not looking great. Mm -hmm. Then finally, you get Arrow back, but you don't really have a particularly good bot lane. And as Local just said, there he had his own problems even in the team in the past. So yeah, their bot lane last year was a, it was just a losing bot lane, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think the big question is, do we get the crown who uh, solo carried games on Victor from two two and a half years ago, or do we get Malzahar crown who gracefully loses lane? but also isn't going to carry. And this is to your point of like, as a jungler, I have a top laner who I'm not super confident in and might be playing losing matchups. I got a mid laner who gracefully loses and I have a bot lane who gets pushed in. Now I've lost all my agency as a jungler. And so even though you have Medios, who I would consider to be one of the top junglers in NA, Gosh. he's not going to accomplish anything. You know how rosters like this used to get by by eating up the budget rosters and like the shitty LCS teams? There's sure. none of that anymore in NALCS. You know the top tier teams, TL, TSM, 100 Thieves, all have three imports. And like the bottom tier teams that we talk about, FlyQuest and Optic, you bring these roster two or three years back, these are easy playoff rosters. Like, right. You, that's what you used to do. Like you sign like a Dardock, you sign like a Meteos, and then you eat up the lower tier teams that can't deal with these star carry players anymore. That's not the reality of NALCS. Like the <laughs> era is just different. So yeah. I, I don't it's see the it. LCS era. We're no longer <laughs> NA. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. There's the bot. There's no bottom feeder teams that you prey on anymore. It's you can't function with a roster like this, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Right. Are we? Do you want to do any viewer questions or anything to close up? Or call? What was the plan for this? Um. I I think we covered a lot of topics. Dash stay yeah, for extra sixty good. minutes. Um. Dash any final words? Anything you want to say? Uh, I'm just excited to get started, man. It's been kind of painful this yeah. last week to watch every other league get rolling, you know, and to see the competitive, you know, competitive landscape yeah. kind of flesh out. And for us to be sitting here going, well, eh, I, I thought it was kind of going. appropriate, you know, NA being behind EU. <laughs> Slow starters. Start the year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all the, all the, all the, we all know them all. Man. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm just, I'm super pumped to, mm -hmm. to get the season started. Um, and to play myself, in all honesty, with the rank season just being released and whatnot, kind of reinvigorated. What, what, what rank do you normally get into? So the last two seasons, I've just sat in plat. My peak was Diamond 5, 100 LP. That's, listen, don't don't downplay yourself. That's literally as good as local can get. My peak like was multiple. Master 200. My <laughs> peak is Master 200. You're talking comparing my floor to his peak. Listen, yeah. local. I don't care about the past, Tommy. What have you done for me lately? It's oh, yeah, how exactly. you are today. Exactly. exactly. I, Listen, I, Crown I, used to be one of the best mid laners in the world. Now he's an optic gaming. Like, get with the times, local. New year, and new I'm, me. <laughs> I'm plat three right now. I'll, you know, I, I but I want to. I want. I would like to hit diamond again. So, yeah. uh, you know, in the new rank system, we'll see how all that goes since it's more role specific. And I am a jungle main top lane oh, secondary. You jungle main. If you get in a diamond, you have to gank the fuck out of local every game you play against. You, you know, I will. Oh my god. So <laughs> I've. Funny story, I play under like a different name, like I play under numbers, because when I played under Lokodoko, mm -hmm. I would get harassed a lot, and also, also I didn't I want to that. <laughs> tell, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. Every uh, game. So I play with a friend that sometimes plays under Riot, and I, like, he's Riot something something, and yeah, I just, everyone's like, nerf Urga, nerf Rengar, and then I'm like, dude, my friend works in marketing, like, he's not responding, like, shut the fuck up, nerf Rengar, it's that guy's fault. I mean, anyway. Anyway, yeah. so I play under this name thinking people don't know me, but recently I played against Dardock in solo queue, and then of course he fucking just smashed me with Rumble Jungle. What was Dardock doing in Diamond 5? Well, he has a Smurf account, and then it's all the oh, way, right. that one, oh. it's in Never. Diamond 1. So I usually meet people on the way up. I met Core JJ also, and then I, I'll say Ooh. hi as they're like going up, and then I'll never see them again. Yeah, why break the habit of a lifetime? <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, you're talking about the game. My apology, I thought you meant your career. My, my oh my fuck. Anyways, yeah. um, the, uh, anyways, like <laughs> people started recognizing that account was mine because later on when I okay. added Dardock and talked to him about it and I was like, yo, did you know it was me? And he was like, of course I knew it was you. I roasted you specifically on purpose. Right. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I love it. But yeah, time. ultimately, I'm just super excited to get the season started. I'm excited for year two of franchise system, you know, Europe moving into year one mm -hmm. and us into our second year. I think it's going to be interesting to kind of track the progression of the leagues and see what the second year of franchising does for us while they're dealing with a lot of the things we dealt with last year. Um, so that should be very exciting. 
Uh, other than that, I just want to thank the viewers, everyone who tuned in or who will watch the VOD, and thank the two of you for being gracious hosts. So thank you very much for having me on. Thank you for coming on, Dash. You were actually one Ooh. of the best guests, and I love doing oh. NA episodes where I can actually talk instead of just sit there and listen and have Doran flame me. <laughs> I love it. I well, still, thank you very much. I still you a bit. You know. it, it was light, and you, you definitely couldn't flame me on my knowledge this time. Well, debatable, but you know, I've got to give you a break every now and then. It's, yeah, he has to pull some, pull some punches. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right. Just, Reserve my energy. All right. Anyway, thanks, man. All right. Thank you.